Hey everybody, uh, so I was really pleased with the warm reception that uh, if I had not stumbled over my words in an earlier iteration of this video, you would have gotten to see her do some really incredible um, cat acrobatics. She still hasn't learned that the birds that fly overhead outside don't come into the living room. Anyway, um, so I, I was really pleased with the warm reception that the Nowhere Land announcement video got. There were a few uh, frequently asked questions that kept showing up, and um, so I wanted to um, I wanted to address them. Uh, the first one, uh, people were asking, will there be physical copies? Uh, no, not at this point, and the reason being that at this point. Physical CDs uh, outside of, you know, a few collectors and that kind of thing, physical CDs are really only practical to sell at shows. You know, for, for an artist at my level, um, they're really only practical to sell at shows and that kind of thing. And I don't have, I'm not planning to do any shows uh, for this right now or anything. Uh, so they're, they're really only practical to sell as merchandise at shows. Um, the other possibility would be like, you know, if this blew up really big and became like the next internet music phenomenon, like everywhere at the end of time or something like that, if something like that were to happen, it might be cool to do like some vinyl pressings for the collectors and that sort of thing. But right now it's just not a good, uh, it's, it's just not a good option. If I, if I did that, what would happen is, um, you know, 10 people would uh, place orders for copies and then I would be left with a box of 240 CDs I couldn't do anything with. So, uh, and the, the I say 240 because 250 is the minimum order from the pressing service that I use for CDs. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so that, you know, that's that. If I, I It would be neat if, if, you know, the opportunity were, were a reasonable possibility. Yeah, it'd be fun to do. I actually have some cool ideas for how you could package the thing and stuff like that, but it, um, it's just not a workable uh, option right now. Uh, anyway, uh, the next question was, why, why is it, why will it not be on YouTube? So, I think there's a little, I may have con created a little bit of confusion here. My saying that it would not be on YouTube was in part me teasing, uh, dropping hints about the idea that it was going to be an album. I was trying to drop very vague hints to get people uh, aware of that. And, you know, logically, you're go most likely going to be listening to music on streaming services now and that kind of thing. Um, to clarify something, though, it will not be on my YouTube channel. It will be it will be available through YouTube Music, the YouTube Music service. So you'll be able to look it up on YouTube and hear it and listen to it and that kind of thing. Um, the reason I'm not putting it on my channel, there are a couple of reasons. One is that um, uh, one of the big ones is just that. Um, if I if I make a video of it, if I make a video file of it, and put it up here on YouTube, the codec is going to com is going to compress uh, audio and video into a single file, which inevitably results in deterioration of the audio quality. And so I was uploading all all while I've been doing this, I've been uploading private videos to YouTube to hear how it sounded, the audio sounded, and there was just inevitable deterioration of the audio quality that. You know, if it were if it were background music for a YouTube video, it would be one thing. But for a project where I want you to really sit with it and listen to it, uh, I just didn't like how it sounded. Granted, I realize this is only a concern for the most uh, you know obsessed audiophiles like myself. Um, and you know, one person jokingly asked me if it was going to be done in spatial audio, and obviously, no, I don't have the ability to produce on the level of um, Billie Eilish or something like that. But it is something I put a lot of time into, and I want it to be heard in the best quality possible. And so that's going to be um, that quality is going to be found in the form of uh, streaming services and that kind of thing. Uh, as opposed to, you know, if, if I upload it to YouTube at the level that I have access to YouTube, it's just not going to sound as good as it could. The YouTube music player, on the other hand, ought to uh, have a, uh, a really solid, uh, really solid pressing of it. So that should be good. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the next question was, a lot of people are saying, why not do Sonichu the musical? 
because and originally I had said um, that I wasn't going to do Sonic Chu the musical because Son the plot of Sonic Chu is nonsense. The characters are all uh, one dimensional uh, avatars for the creator himself, who is also a character within the story, and. Uh, other, you know, just other things like that, that you have to be uh, intimately familiar with multitudes of unrelated cartoon franchises and uh, <clears throat> and all of that. And so, um, so all of those reasons, people are saying, well, you know, a few people asked me, they said, well, musicals, the plots to musicals are normally absurd. They're normally, they're often ridiculous and often don't make sense outside of the context of a musical. So isn't Sonic Chu perfect for that? Well, the thing is, yes, a lot of musicals have ridiculous plots, but they work because they have great characters. You know, perfect example, Rocky Horror Picture Show. The plot is complete nonsense. It is it it willfully it willfully and uh, knowingly exaggerates uh, B movie horror and science fiction tropes and. Uh, <clears throat> to this absurdist degree. Uh, the plot is ridiculous, but you have great characters, you know, especially Frankenfurter is a great character, especially Tim Curry giving uh, one of his all-time most iconic performances as Frankenfurter. You know, uh, these, are, uh, these are great characters, and that really is what makes a good musical work. Um, you know, on, on the flip side, it's kind of like Lindsay Ellis talks about... Um, uh, Lindsay Ellis did a video talking about the musical Rent, really the movie adaptation of Rent, <clears throat> but the musical Rent, and she points out correctly that, you know, if you, the Rent, if you take away, if you take AIDS out of the equation, uh, the characters in Rent are really just a bunch of whiny post-college 20-somethings that don't want to take responsibility for their lives, you know? So it's not, it, the, the characters really aren't that great once you get out of the sensational aspect of it. Uh, uh, further bolstering my point, the perfect example of my point would be uh, the movie Cats. You know, Cats, the plot of Cats, if you actually stop and try to talk about it, um, is uh, it, if you try to make sense of it, it's like, okay, wait a minute. So there's a bunch of homeless cats and they're called Jellical cats. We don't really know what that means, but it's like a group of people, a group of cats, an old Deuteronomy picks one of them to die every year, but the cats are really excited about it and they're, they all want to be the one that dies. And, you know, it's kind of like when you start thinking about that, uh, that gets to the to where, you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber famously told uh, one of the producers of the musical just said, Hal... It's about cats. And that's the thing. Cats is not meant to be um, analyzed very deeply because, yeah, if you start to analyze it, it starts to seem like Logan's run with cats or something like that. But the appeal of cats is that every one of these cats that steps up and sings a little song about themselves is telling a little story. These are all little vignettes, and th those little vignettes occur because you have these great, distinct little characters that uh, everybody can get into and appreciate and enjoy, and they're great, they're great characters. They work off of great archetypes. So, you know, you have Bustopher Jones, who is the stuck-up, aristocratic, nose-in-the-air, high-society type. You have uh, the Rum Tum Tugger, who is the glam rock, David Bowie type character. And you have, um, you know, Grizabella, the glamour cat, who is the faded, uh, the faded beauty, the, the, um, the, the once, uh, once gorgeous Hollywood starlet who's now faded and become an old woman that nobody pays attention to anymore. These are great characters, and you can sing, you can write great songs about these characters. You really can't, I mean, how does everybody describe Sonic you? He's a yellow Sonic. How does everybody, um, from, how does everybody describe Rosa Chu? Well, she's a uh, she's a pink Sonic, or she's the she's really just uh, is it Rosie or Rose or whatever is the character from Sonic CD? It's been a while, but uh, the the love interest from Sonic CD. That's all she is. That's all these characters are, because you have to remember Chris is writing at the level of a small child who's playing with his action figures and says, "Ha ha! Now I've got you. Not if I have anything to say about it." Like, that's literally the level that the characters are developed to. 
And so, and, and, you know, to give you an idea of how poorly developed those characters are, all of the male characters within that universe are called Sonichus, and all of the female characters within that universe are called Rosichus, you know. So it really, there's really not anything, uh, not anything worthwhile to, to develop there. Sonichu is ultimately interesting to people who follow Chris Chan because they have followed the Chris Chan lore so specifically and so in depth that when they read the Sonichu comics, they know what was going on in Chris's life when he wrote the Sonichu comics. So they know what he was trying to escape from in his life when he wrote the comics and what he was trying to, um, you know, what, what he was trying to psychologically process and that sort of thing. So then it becomes interesting. And that's why, you know, that's why that's the angle that I took in Nowhere Land, which you'll, you know, you'll see that when it, when you hear it. Um, that's what's interesting. The actual Sonichu in and of itself to an outsider who knows nothing about Chris Chan, it's just going to look like Teletubbies that fuck. So there's really nothing to get into there. Anyway, the last question somebody said was, is this wise? Is it a good idea to devote my time, effort, energy, skill, and everything into a project about Chris Chan because everything that involves Chris Chan eventually just goes to shit anyway? And wouldn't it be better to, uh, you know, to, to do something else? Um, you know what? You're absolutely right. It's not a good idea. This is not a good idea. It's not good to get on Chris Chan's radar. It's not good to, um, uh, it's not good to devote all of this time and energy to a project about this cretinous weirdo that people follow out of uh, morbid fascination and all of that. But I'll tell you what it did for me. Uh, I've been, for the last few years, I've been having this really bad existential crisis about, um, I'm still a little bit too young for a midlife crisis, but maybe it's that, I, maybe it's something like that, I don't know, but just feeling like I chose the wrong direction in life because I know that I have the mind that, a mind that if I had applied myself to it, I could have gone out and become an attorney or I could have become a doctor or a, um, a psychoanalyst or something like that. So, you know, gone into a career where the, the, the average income is uh, 250000 a year on the low end, you know, that kind of thing. Could have gone into uh, one of those careers. Ah, sorry. <laughs> could have gone into um, one of those careers. And I've been thinking about it and looking at everything I've created and been asking myself, has it been worth it, you know? And ha has it been worth it to go down this weird self-indulgent, um, the, the, this weird self-indulgent rabbit hole of just, you know, following my own muses, amusing the muses, confusing the masses, as the residents would say. And it's weird because in that, in the time that I've uh, been having that existential crisis, I've put out some things that have been um, really, honestly, some of my best stuff. I mean, the, the two Axis of Empires albums that have come out, uh, everything that I've done with my jazz project, Other Strangers, um, all of the stuff, you know, uh, stuff like that has been coming out and, and stuff that uh, I, ha I should be proud of and, and am proud of. But the thing is, it's still, it's still overcome with this overwhelming depression uh, from arising from feeling like I've just wasted my life acting like the same, the same artsy drama club nerd that I was in high school and I should have grown up and done something proper with my life. And that has made creating things very, very difficult for me. Um, more and more, the act of creation has become something that I, uh, that has been difficult, very difficult for me and very burdensome. Uh, and it's hard to, it's hard to work up the motivation to, uh, to practice my guitar, to uh, write new music, all of that stuff. And when I had this idea, 
I, it was an idea that I got really excited about. And that alone was enough to make it worth my while to do this. Like, finally having this project where it's like, this is a cool idea I have, I can envision this whole project from beginning to end, what I want to do with it, and it didn't just feel like, um, it, it wasn't just me thinking, well, okay, I'll write ten new songs and see if more than five people want to listen to it, you know. It finally felt like something where it was like, this is a cool idea, regardless of what comes out of it. This is such a cool idea that I can really get behind and really enjoy creating for the sake of creating it. And so that alone motivated me. And, you know, a few friends actually suggested, they said, well, maybe if it's just a therapy process for you, you should just record the album and put it on a shelf. Just do it for the sake of doing it. <clears throat> Don't put it out and just get, you know, just do it for the sake of doing it and move on to other things. And, you know, there's something to be said for that. Like, uh, The Residents did, uh, one of my favorite bands, The Residents did uh, an album called Not Available, which was initially recorded with the intention of not putting it out, or at least never putting it out until the group had forgotten it existed. And it was ultimately released because they were behind they were behind schedule on the album Eskimo and the record label needed something to put out, so they put out Not Available, um, which is an incredible album. Uh, but um, it, you know, there's, there's something to be said for that, doing it for the sake of, you know, just the process of it. But, you know, I already have tons, you know, uh, similarly, just like Prince himself, you know, had recorded tons of material he never released in his lifetime, and now the estate is putting it out. I have tons of ideas and things that I've demoed and tracked and haven't released. Uh, most musicians, most creative people do. So I've got tons of that already. And part of this, part of this process, I feel like, is putting it out there, is getting it out, releasing it, doing it. Uh, getting that ball rolling uh, is part of the process and part of the therapy. So to answer your question, no, it's an incredibly foolhardy, ridiculous idea. Uh, but even so, I still need to do it for my own, uh, for my own sake and to to get to get this out there and complete you know to me a project is not completed until it's released to get this project out there and get people you know get it out to where people can hear it so that's where I stand with it um by the way as I make this video I just got the notification from uh, CD Baby that the album has cleared their inspection it's been cleared for distribution which that means that all of the you know all the technical aspects all of the files are good all of the um, all of the legal aspects all the paperwork is filled out correctly and all of the uh, you know they do all the mechanical royalties uh, and everything for the uh, for each of the songs and so all of that has been uh, done done correctly and everything and it is now cleared for distribution so they will be shipping it out to um, the various um, the, the various uh, outlets, you know, Spotify, iTunes, all of that stuff, Apple Music, uh, you know, fairly soon within, you know, within the next um, few days, hopefully. Uh, that's good because that's usually the longest part of the process. Uh, I found, you know, that part, that process can take you know, as much as two weeks or two or three weeks. Usually once it ships out, it becomes available pretty quickly. So I'm hoping that it will you know, start showing up on the digital shelves pretty soon. Uh, and I, uh, regardless of that, we're definitely on track to see it come out before Chris's next court hearing, which was the deadline I set for myself. So anyway, those are some FAQs. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, uh, you know, feel free to ask and I can uh, try to answer them to the best of my ability. Peace.